Hello and welcome to SBSS Advanced. My name is Nairi Mason and I am a presenter with the Digital Literacy Team at the ANU. I've been working with SPSS for 27 years now. So after this class, if you have any questions about how to use SPSS for your data, please feel free to email me at nairi.mason at anu.edu.au or contact the digital literacy team. If you haven't already got the SPSS exercise files for this class, you can download it at this website. Just click on the SBSS tab and then download the following three files, employee data, anxiety underscore two, and car sales. We will begin with the employee underscore data dot sav file. The PDF handout for this class can be found at this web address here and there will be some extra information in that that you might find handy. This class will cover the importance of checking the underlying assumptions and effect sizes for each test that we conduct. Um, we will also look at t-tests, chi-square analysis, correlation, multiple linear regression, independent samples, two-way analysis of variance, a paired samples analysis of variance, as well as a factor analysis using principal components analysis. Underlying assumptions. Because most of the people who come to my classes don't actually have a strong statistical background, many are aware that every statistical test has, an, has a series of underlying assumptions about your data. So if your data does not meet one or more of these underlying assumptions, any probability estimates that SPSS gives you may not be valid. So when it says the probability is less than 0.05, that might not actually be the case. It's also important to check the effect sizes of each of your tests, because even when a statistic is significant, it doesn't mean it's substantial or important. So you always have to assess the size of the effect when you get a significant result. But please note, even if you do get a very, very small effect size, that can still be important, especially if it means the difference between life and death, for example. In order to explain why it's important to check the underlying assumptions and effect sizes for each test, We'll start with an example of t-tests. The first underlying assumption we'll look at is that of normality. Here we see the distribution of current salary for females and males. The distribution for females is roughly normally distributed and the distribution for males is positively skewed. It's called a positive skew because the tail tends to point towards the high end of the range. If it was the reverse, it would be called a negative skew. The first problem with violations of normality assumptions is that if your data is sampled from a population that does have a normal distribution, then your sample should also have a normal distribution. If it does not, then you may have some sampling bias. Another problem is because a t-test compares the means for two groups, the mean in a normally distributed population and sample will be representative of the majority of the data, as you can see here for females. But if it's skewed, the mean is not representative of the majority of the data. So it doesn't really make sense to compare the means for both of these groups. The second underlying assumption of a t-test is homogeneity of variance. And this is all about the variability in your distributions. You can see here that the variability in current salaries for females is quite a bit smaller than it is for males. The reason why you would expect these to be equal is also because of population considerations. If you had randomly sampled from the same population, you would have the same variability in both groups. The probability estimates assume both normality 
and homogeneity of variance. So therefore, when the probability estimates are calculated, they assume that your groups follow these rules. But if the groups you're comparing do not follow the rules, those probability estimates are incorrect. So what do you do when the assumptions are violated? Well, first of all, don't panic. There are other statistical tests that you can use. In particular, for a t-test, you can compare medians instead of means, which do not assume normality. But they do assume the distributions of both groups are the same. For example, that they are both positively skewed. An example of these tests are Wilcoxon's sign rank test and Man Whitney U. Effect size is also an important consideration. If your data has met the underlying assumptions of your tests and you get a significant result, then that doesn't necessarily mean that the result is an important or substantial one. For a t-test, we calculate something called Cohen's D as a measure of effect size. Here is the formula, and these are the benchmarks for the result. The benchmarks give you some idea of what a small, medium and large effect would be given the result of this formula. And we will have a look at the underlying assumptions as well as the effect size for a t-test very shortly. So first of all, we're going to conduct a t-test. We are going to compare the current salary of males and females. So to do that, we go into the Analyze menu, go to Compare Means, because we are comparing means in a t-test. And you might notice that there are three main types of t-tests you can perform. The first type is a one-sample t-test, which is what you would use when you're comparing the mean from your sample to a hypothetical mean or a mean that somebody else got in their research. What it essentially does is it creates a 95% confidence interval around your mean, and if the hypothetical mean fits within that confidence interval, it means it is not statistically significant. The next type of t-test is an independent samples t-test. This is the kind of test you would use if you're comparing the means for two groups that are mutually exclusive. So for example, the people in group A are completely different to the people in group B. So their results are not related to each other in any way. A paired samples t-test is what you would use if you're comparing two groups that are related in some way. So either they are exactly the same people in group A and B, or they are related. So for example, they might be husbands and wives and you're measuring their marriage satisfaction score, for example. Their scores you would think would be correlated to some extent. So therefore you have to take that into account when you are comparing the means of both groups. In this case, we're comparing males and females and their current salary. They are mutually exclusive groups and we conduct an independent samples t-test. In the test variables box, we will put in the variable of interest, the dependent variable, which is current salary. So if you click on current salary, then click on the arrow to move it into the test variables box. These arrows are used to move variables in and out of the relevant boxes. You can put more than one dependent variable into this box and use the same grouping variable to conduct multiple t-tests if you wish, but we'll just leave it as is. Our grouping variable is going to be gender. So gender is our independent or grouping variable in this case. So I will move that into the grouping variable box. You might notice that there are two question marks here. And that's because it's possible to put in a variable that has more than two groups into the grouping variable box. A t-test can only compare two groups. So you have to tell SVSS which of the groups in this variable do you want to compare. So although gender only has two possible values, we still have to tell SVSS what those values to compare are. So now if you click on define groups, 
Group one, males were coded as little m, so lowercase m, and it is case sensitive, so be aware of that. Group two is coded with a little f. So I'll put that into group two, click continue, and then OK. And here we have our output viewer. So I'll just make that a bit larger. The first box tells us our descriptive statistics. Um, N tells you how many males and females there were. We then get the mean, the standard deviation for both groups, and also the standard error of the mean. Now, remember, one of the underlying assumptions of a t-test is normality of the distributions. And the distributions I showed you before were for these particular groups. So technically it is not appropriate to perform a t-test for this data because the male distribution was not normal, normally distributed. But as an example of the process of conducting a t-test, we will continue with this. The other underlying assumption was homogeneity of variance. And variance is just the standard deviation squared. So if you square these values, you can already tell that we have a problem with the homogeneity of variance assumption as well. The homogeneity of variance assumption is also tested statistically here in the independent samples test box. The first two columns give us Levine's test for equality of variances. So it sees if the difference between the male and female variances are significantly different. It performs something called an F-test, and then it gives you a significance level. The significance here says 0 0.000. This does not mean the probability is zero. It just means that to three decimal places, the probability is zero. You would report this as P less than 0.001. In any case, most disciplines state that if your significance level is less than 0.05, you have a significant result. So this is saying that there is a statistically significant difference between the variances for males and females. So the assumption of homogeneity of variance has been violated. But there is a correction for violations of this assumption in a t-test and it's displayed in SPSS. So you'll see here to the left, we have one row for equal variances assumed. So this is a standard unadjusted t-test result. Then it has another one for equal variances not assumed. And here we can't assume equal variances. So this T value and the degrees of freedom have been adjusted for that violation. So here we have a T value of 11.688, degrees of freedom around 344. And with that adjustment, the statistic is still significant. So it's less than 0 0.001. These are the statistics that you would report for this particular test because of the violation that has occurred. In this table, we're also given the mean difference. So that's the difference between the means in absolute terms, the standard error of that difference, and also the 95% confidence interval of the difference. So this is not a confidence interval around one of those means. It's a confidence interval around the mean difference. This is another way of performing a significance test. If the hypothetical value of zero, representing no difference between the means, is plausible, then it would fit within this confidence interval. However, zero does not fit within this confidence interval, which is another reason why you can say there is a statistically significant difference between the means. You'll also notice that the confidence interval for equal variance is not assumed has also been adjusted. Now, because we have a significant statistic, 
we need to see what the size of the effect is. So is the difference between these two means large enough to consider it a large effect size or a medium or a small one? So to do that, we would have to calculate the Cohen's D measure of effect size, which I showed you earlier. The formula is also in the handout. When you calculate Cohen's D, it turns out to be 1.042. The cutoff for a large effect was 0 0.8. So this would be considered quite a large difference. The next type of analysis I'll show you is a chi-square analysis. There are two ways to do a chi-square analysis in SPSS, but I'll show you the most common application. And that is where we have two independent variables and we want to assess the relationship between them. For this particular example, we'll have a look at the relationship between a person's position in the company and whether or not they are in a minority classification. So to do that, we go into the Analyze menu. Descriptive statistics in this instance, which seems a little counterintuitive, but this is the only way to do a chi-square analysis when you look at the relationship between two variables. If you are only looking at one variable, you would do that through non-parametric tests, legacy dialogues, and chi-square is available there. But as I said, you can only look at one variable at a time if you go through non-parametric tests. So we're looking at the relationship between two variables. So descriptive statistics and then cross tabs. Okay, so we're going to look at the relationship between employment category. So I will put employment category into the rows box and minority classification into the columns box. If you now click on the statistics button on the right hand side, we will ask for chi-square. And I'm also going to ask for phi and Cramer's V because this will give us a measure of effect size if the chi-square is significant. There are other options that you can use instead of chi-square. If both of your variables are nominal levels of measurement, you would pick one of these options. And if you have two ordinal levels of measurement, you can choose one of these. I'm choosing phi and Cramer's V because at the moment we have two nominal levels of measurement. So I'll now click continue. Then we need to click on the cells button. Because a chi-square looks at the difference between observed values and what you would expect to get by chance alone, we need to see what those expected values are as well in order to interpret any significant statistics. So we'll tick observed and expected counts, then continue and OK. And here is our output. So the first table just tells us how many valid cases there were and how many missing cases there were. And in this particular data set, there are no missing cases. So we have 474 people included in this analysis. The next table is our cross tabulation or contingency table. And it outlines the probabilities that we would expect to get by chance alone in each of the cells of these tables, as well as the frequencies we actually got. So in the count rows, we have our observed frequencies, and then we have our expected counts underneath that. Here we can see that 276 people in clerical positions were not in a minority classification. However, we did expect more, around 283 people. There were 87 people in clerical positions who were in a minority classification, and we expected less. A similar pattern is found for custodial positions. We saw 14 people who were not in a minority and we expected more. We saw 13 people who were in a minority and we expected less. The observed pattern is actually reversed for managing positions. So we saw 80 people who were not in a minority classification, but we expected less. 
and we saw four people who were in a minority classification and we expected more. So there does seem to be a pattern to this data, but whether or not we have a significant pattern is determined by the chi-square test below. So the chi-square value was 26.172, two degrees of freedom, and the significance level is less than 0 0.001. So this means there is a significant pattern. There is a significant difference between the observed and expected counts. There is only one main underlying assumption for a chi-square test, and that is indicated by this footnote at the bottom of the table. Here it says zero cells have an expected count less than five. Remember the expected counts relate to the probability estimates, what you would expect to get by chance alone. If more than 20% of those cells in the table have an expected count less than five, your probability estimates are not reliable. This problem can occur when you have a very, very large contingency table and you have very low numbers in some of the cells, like the observed cells. This can lead to very low expected counts and even below five, even expected counts of zero. If you ever encounter that problem and it makes sense to do so, one way to get around it is to try and collapse some of the categories in your table. So for example here, if we had that problem, you could probably justify collapsing custodial and clerical positions and comparing them against management. But at the moment, we don't have a problem. So this probability estimate is going to be reliable and there is a significant difference between the observed and expected values. The symmetric values box at the bottom um, tells you about the phi and Kramer's V statistics. And these are estimates of effect size because they always range from zero to one. The next type of analysis I'll show you is a correlation. We're going to look at the correlation between three variables to create a correlation matrix. So to do that, we go into the Analyze menu, choose Correlate, and then Bivariate. The three variables I'm going to look at are Current Salary, Education Level in Years, and Previous Experience in Months. Pearson's Correlation Coefficient is always ticked by default. If you had two ordinal levels of measurement or three ordinal levels of measurement in the variables box, you would probably choose Kendall's Tau or Spearman instead. But these are scale levels of measurement and I will click OK. And here we have our correlation matrix. You'll notice that the values in the top triangular portion are identical to those in the bottom triangular portion here. A value of one is found along the diagonal because that is the correlation between each variable and itself. Correlations range from negative one, which is a perfect negative relationship. In that sense, when one variable increases, the other variable decreases and you tend to get a line that shape. It then ranges up to positive one, where one variable increases, so is the other one. And positive one is a perfect positive relationship and will be sloping that way. A correlation of zero is also possible or close to zero. And this means that there's no relationship whatsoever. So you will get a bit of an amorphous um, cluster of points in a scatter plot if you have a zero correlation or close to it. So here we can see that the relationship between a person's current salary and their education level in years is 0.661. Correlations also give you a measure of effect size, essentially. So the closer it is to one, the stronger the relationship is. 
and this is 0.661, which was more than halfway between zero and positive one. So that means there's a pretty strong correlation between salary and education. It's also a positive correlation. So as educational level in years increases, so does a person's current salary. It is a significant correlation, as indicated here. The probability is less than 0.001. The next correlation is between previous experience and current salary. This is a negative correlation. So that means the more previous experience you had before joining the company, the less you earn now. The correlation is quite small. It's heading towards zero correlation. It's only 0.097. But it is significant because the significance level is less than 0.05. So this just goes to show that even when something is statistically significant, it doesn't necessarily mean it has a large or an important effect. In future research, if you're trying to explain how much somebody gets paid, you probably would not bother trying to use previous experience in months to explain it. The third correlation in this table is between education level in years and previous experience. This is also a negative correlation, negative 0 0.252. It's a small correlation, but more substantial than the one we saw previously. And it is also significant at less than 0 0.001. So because it's a negative correlation, it suggests that the longer people stayed in school, the less previous experience they had before joining the company. The next analysis we'll have a look at is multiple linear regression. Multiple linear regression is similar to correlation in that it looks at the relationship between variables, but it tries to find the best combination of variables to predict an outcome or response variable. So in this particular analysis, we will have a look at what combination of variables can explain how much a person gets paid in this company. So to do that, we go to the Analyze menu, Regression, and the second one down, linear regression. Our dependent variable is going to be current salary. So we'll move that into the dependent box. We've already seen that education level is related to salary. So we'll see how well it can predict a person's salary in combination with other variables. So I'll put education level into the independence box. We also know that previous experience has some predictive power. So I'll also put that into the box. And we'll also have a look at whether or not minority classification affects how much a person gets paid. So we'll put that into the box as well. Minority classification is a binary variable, which means it only has a yes, no response. But this has been coded as zero and one, zero for no, and one for yes, which allows us to put that into a regression analysis quite easily. If you have a large number of variables and you're performing a regression analysis and you want to find the best linear combination with the smallest number of variables, you can also choose stepwise methods from the method box here and its drop down menu. So you probably either use stepwise forward entry or backward entry options. But for now, we'll just keep it simple. If you click on the statistics button, we are going to ask for some checks of the underlying assumptions of a regression analysis. So the first one we'll look for are called collinearity diagnostics. And this is about the correlation between the predictor variables, the variables in this box. If they are highly correlated with each other, then not all of them are needed in the model. So for example, if previous experience and education level were very strongly correlated to about 0.8, then you would only need one of those variables in the equation because they were both essentially me measuring the same variance. 
in current salary. So we're going to check collinearity diagnostics. And I'll also tick the case-wise diagnostics, which is what you use to look for univariate outliers. So these are outliers that you only see in two-dimensional correlation charts. So I'll now click continue. And I'll just show you an example of what a univariate outlier might look like. So we only have two variables here, education level and years and current salary. Here's the relationship between the two. And there is one point, case number 29, that doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of the data. Univariate outliers are not necessarily a problem for multiple linear regression. However, if that particular case is also a multivariate outlier, then something might need to be done about it. And we'll just go on to the plots button now. This is where we assess things called standardized residuals. Now, standardized residuals refer to something like this. So these are the individual dots in the scatter plot that we saw before, and the distance they are away from the regression line, or if you think of it more as the predicted place where those spots would be according to the regression line, the distance between the point and what was predicted is called a residual. And one of the underlying assumptions of multiple linear regression is that these distances or residuals are normally distributed. So that's why we need to create these standardized residual plots. And I'm gonna tick both the histogram and normal probability plot it gives us the same information, just in two different graphical ways. We're also going to ask for another type of standardized residual plot, which will help us assess the linearity of our model, um, as well as the constancy of the variance in our model. So I'm going to click on ZPRED, which stands for Standardized Predicted Values. And I'll put that into the X box. Then Z resid, so standardized residuals, and put that into the Y box. Then we'll click continue. Next, I'll click on the save button. Everything here will create a new column in your data set if you tick one of these boxes. And I'm going to tick these three distances boxes because it gives me three different measures relating to multivariate outliers. So in terms of multivariate outliers, I'll just show you an example. These are outliers that you get when looking at your variables in three-dimensional space. So they are not necessarily seen when you're looking at two variables at a time, but when you put a third variable into the relationship, it sticks out. So here's case number 29 that we saw before, relating to educational level and years and current salary. But when you put the person's age into the relationship as well, another person stands out. And that's case number 341. Multivariate outliers are more problematic than univariate ones. They tend to have a gravitational pull of their own. So if you can imagine that there's a linear relationship here, a straight line, a multivariate outlier that's influential can move the line towards it, making prediction less accurate because it doesn't really relate to the entire data set. It only relates to the outliers that are pulling the regression line towards it. So we need to look for those. And that's what we're doing here by taking Mahalanobis, Cooks and Leverage values. So by doing this, we will get three new columns in the data set. We'll also get a summary table telling us the lowest and highest values for each one of these distances. 
If the highest value is higher than a critical cutoff score, then it means we may have a multivariate outlier to deal with. Then you have to go to the data set afterwards, have a look in those columns and find the high values. For now, we'll click continue. Okay, so if you now click on the options button, you can see here at the bottom of the box something called missing values. And this is where you tell SBSS how you want to deal with missing values. This is an option in most of the analyses and it's important for you to understand what this means. So if, for example, if you have three independent variables and you want to look at the correlation between all three of them or you want to put all three of them into a regression analysis. If one of those variables has one case that is missing, has, is missing a data point, then it excludes that entire case for the entire analysis. However, if you choose to exclude cases pairwise, it keeps that case in the analysis. It only excludes it when the comparison is between the variable with the missing case and other variables where there are no missing cases. So oftentimes if you have a lot of missing data and you exclude cases list-wise, it can remove a lot of cases from the entire analysis. So if you do have a problem with missing data, you might want to exclude cases pairwise instead. Okay, so I will click continue because we have no missing data in this data set. Okay, so now we will just click OK and run the analysis. And here we have the regression output. The first box tells you which independent variables were used in the regression model. So we have minority, education and previous experience. It also tells us what the dependent variable was. The second box is called the model summary and that provides the R squared value. This is a measure of effect size. An R squared value of 0 0.451 signifies that 45.1% of the variance in current salary, the dependent variable, can be explained by a linear combination of these three variables. The analysis of variance table, the ANOVA table here, tells us whether or not it is a significant model and whether or not that's a significant amount of variance. And considering it's 45%, it's not inconsiderable. The ANOVA for three and 470 degrees of freedom is 128.868 and the significance level is less than 0.001. So yes, it is a significant model. However, that doesn't mean that all the variables in the model are significant predictors. It only means that at least one of our predictor variables is significant. So to find out which ones are significant, we have to look at the coefficients table. The coefficients table gives us what's called the slope coefficient. So this is the slope of the regression line as each unit of salary increases by one. The B value for the constant in the first row is actually the intercept value, and this is the point at which the regression line crosses the y-axis. So to see if we have a significant predictor or not, it performs a t-test, and the t-test compares the difference between the slope coefficient and the hypothetical slope coefficient of zero, or a flat line, there is no relationship between the predictor and the dependent variable. So here for education level and years, the t value is 18.846, and the significance level of that is less than 0 0.001. So yes, education level and years is a significant predictor, which is unsurprising because there was quite a strong correlation between education and salary in the correlation matrix we saw earlier. The next variable, previous experience in months, the T value for that predictor is 2.417. 
and that is also significant, but it's less than 0 0.05. And that's reflected in the, well, the weaker correlation between previous experience and salary that we saw earlier. Minority classification is the third variable we put into the regression equation. And that T value is negative 2.907. And the significance level is less than 0.01, which means that is also a significant predictor. Now, because it has a negative slope coefficient, this tells us about the difference between the variables or the difference between the minority classifications. So if I can just illustrate here, because it's a negative slope, the line goes this way. Zero for minority and one for minority on the x-axis. Zero stood for not in a minority and one stood for yes. So that means in terms of being able to predict salary that people who are not in a minority classification earn significantly more than people who are. So the sign of the regression slope is important to interpreting the data. In terms of the importance or the relative importance of these predictors, we can't compare the slopes to determine which one's more important than which because they're all measured on different scales. So education is measured in years, experience in months, and minority classification is just zero and one. But we can compare them based on the standardized coefficients. So this has standardized the data so that they're comparing apples and apples instead of apples and oranges. And when the data is standardized, you can compare the slope coefficients and tell which one's more important as a predictor for salary. So education level in years has a higher standardized beta coefficient of 0 0.669. The next most important predictor is minority classification at 0.101. And previous experience is the least important predictor. We're also given information about the collinearity statistics. So this is about the multicollinearity or the, the multiple correlations between the predictors in this model. The tolerance value should be as close to one as possible, and it is for all of these variables, as well as the variance inflation factor being less than the critical value of five. So all of these are quite a bit lower than five. So these statistics are saying that one of our first assumptions that there is no multicollinearity in the data has been satisfied. Uh, you can ignore the collinearity diagnostics table um, and we'll skip on to the case-wise diagnostics one instead. So the case-wise diagnostics tells us about um, univariate outliers. So we would hope that these values are as close to three as possible in the standardized residual column. Um, there are some that are past four and there is one particular standout which is 6.022. And this is case number 29, which you may recall from earlier um, in the introductory course, case number 29 gets paid quite a lot of money in this company and probably owns the business. So that's why that person stands out as an outlier. Univariate outliers are not as important as multivariate outliers. So if case number 29 is also a multivariate outlier, you might want to consider doing something about it. Um, you could possibly in this instance argue that um, this case is not representative of the rest of the salaries in the company and you might be justified in deleting it from your data set. But generally when dealing with outliers, we prefer to reduce their influence rather than deleting them altogether. And there are ways of reducing their influence. The next table tells us about the multivariate um, outliers. So it gives us a summary of the minimum and maximum values for all of these different statistics. But the ones I'm looking at now are Mahalanobis's distance, Cook's distance, and centered leverage value. So in terms of the critical values, 
that establish the cutoffs for these, um, these measures of distance. Mahalanobis' distance has a cutoff value of the chi-square value for three degrees of freedom in this instance. So the degrees of freedom for chi-square depends on how many independent or predictor variables you have in the model. We have three independent variables, so therefore we look at the chi-square for three degrees of freedom, and that turns out to be 7.815. So this value is quite a bit larger and suggests that there is at least one multivariate outlier to look for. Cook's distance has a cutoff value of 1 and this is well below 1 so that's suggesting that there are not any um, multivariate outliers. And the centred leverage cutoff is determined by a special equation which I have put in your handout and in this case it turns out that the cutoff value was 0.025. So this value is quite a bit higher than that and is also suggesting that there are multivariate outliers that are influential. So because at least two of these measures has said that there are influential multivariate outliers to look for, that means that we have to go into the data set and have a look for those particular values in the Mahals, Cooks and Leverage columns that have been created in the data set for us. So if I right click on Mahals, I can sort descending. So it sorts from the lowest to the highest. And that's saying that case number 295 is a multivariate outlier. And in fact, everything that is above the chi-square critical value will be considered a potential multivariate outlier. And then you have to assess whether or not the Cook's value and the leverage value is also quite large for those cases and deal with them that way. Okay, so I'll go back to the output. Um, if you scroll down a bit further, uh, we can see the main check for the assumption of normality in the distribution of standardized residuals. So this is all about the distances between the actual points in the scatter plot and what was predicted on the regression line. And you can see here in the histogram, it's roughly normally distributed. Um, there's one potential outlier here, but it's not really influencing the distribution very much. So the assumption of normality has been accepted. If we scroll down to the normal PP plot, believe it or not, this tells us exactly the same thing that the histogram does, only it's a different graphical representation. Normality is um, illustrated by this straight line and our actual data is illustrated by this wavy line here. Now it may seem to you that it doesn't really follow the straight line very well but believe it or not this is not bad at all. Um, if it's really really wavy then you have a problem with normality. But the histogram backs up the conclusion that the normality assumption is acceptable. So now if I scroll down to the last one of our um, charts, this our graph is really important for determining whether or not we have a linear relationship between our variables and also the assumption of homoscedasticity. So I'll deal with linearity first. You can see that this data tends to follow a curvy line. This is not a straight line, so therefore a straight line equation is not appropriate for the relationship. It's not appropriate for describing the relationship between the independent variables and the dependent variable. And that's a fundamental assumption of linear regression, that it does follow a straight line. So this is suggesting you're probably looking at non-linear methods to describe this relationship. Another problem with this graph is called heteroscedasticity. Heteroscedasticity is when the amount of variance that you have at one end of the relationship suddenly grows to the other end of the relationship. So you kind of get a funnel shape in terms of variance. 
What we would like to see is something that fits within a nice little rectangle, preferably centered around the zero line. But unfortunately, that's not happening here. So we have violated this assumption of homoscedasticity, and we have also violated the assumption of linearity. Plus, we have violated the assumption of no multivariate outliers. So this data does need to be cleared up um, before we can get any accurate probability statistics. And that can be done. Um, I've personally found that you can um, deal with the heteroscedasticity problem as well as the influence of multivariate outliers quite well if you take a natural log transformation of current salary. However, the linearity assumption is still questionable. The next type of analysis I'm going to show you is an analysis of variance. I'm going to do a two-way analysis of variance, which means that I have two independent variables. And the way to do that is to go into the Analyze menu, not under Compare Means, even though we are comparing means. And yes, there is an option for analysis of variance here, but this is a one-way analysis of variance. One way refers to the number of independent variables that you have in your design. The analysis of variance I want to do has two independent variables, so I have to go through general linear model. General linear model has three options. The first one is called univariate, and this relates to the number of dependent variables you have. So if you only have one dependent variable, as most people do in their experimental designs, you would go through the univariate option. The multivariate option is when you have more than one dependent variable. And sometimes you will have multiple dependent variables, but you want to analyze the means for the same groups for all of those dependent variables. You can do that all in one go by going through the multivariate option. The repeated measures option is similar to the paired samples t-test that we saw earlier. If you have a repeated measures design, it means you have a paired samples design. It's just different terminology. So if the groups you're comparing are the same people, for example, or they are related in some way, you need to perform a repeated measures design, ANOVA. And we'll have a look at a repeated measures ANOVA a little bit later. But I'm going to perform a univariate analysis of variance with two independent variables. Um, and you might want to note that if you need to perform an analysis of covariance, you would also need to go through the general linear model option because it allows you to put a covariate into the box and into the model. Okay, so in this particular analysis, I'm going to look at the different mean education levels in years. So education level in years will be my dependent variable. And I'm going to be comparing the two employment, three employment categories. So I'll put that into the fixed factor box. I'm also going to compare the two minority classification groups. So I'll put that into the fixed factor box. And also the beauty of a two-way analysis of variance is you can not only look at the main effects of these variables, you can also look at the interaction between them. And interaction effects relate to a difference in the difference between the means, depending on what group they are on your second variable. So for example, is the difference in employment category in the same pattern for people who are in a minority classification as they are for people who are not in a minority classification. So that's what I mean by an interaction effect, but I'll explain that a little bit later anyway when we have a look at the plots. Okay, um, so the first thing we'll do is click on the plots button. These plots will give me an idea about um, the pattern of means. So it will plot the means for each one of the three job categories within each of the minority groups as well. So I will get a total of six means on this plot. And I will also get an idea of whether or not there's an interaction between them. So I'm gonna put job category onto the horizontal axis. 
and minority classification in the separate lines box. Then click the add button to move it into the plots box because it's not, if it's not in this box, it's basically not gonna happen. I'm also going to ask SPSS to include error bars. This will provide error bars around each of the six means that appear on this plot because we'll get a mean for job category one in a minority group, job category two in a minority group, and so on. And give us an idea of any um, interaction effects as well as whether or not there may be significant differences between the individual groups. So I'm gonna ask for the standard error bars. Um, we usually use a multiplier of two, so I'm gonna use that as a default, and then click continue. The next thing I'm going to do is click on the post hoc tests box. Normally we don't do post hoc tests until we find out if there is a significant main effect. So if there was a significant main effect for job category, I would then rerun this analysis and ask for a post hoc test for job category. But we might as well run it now, um, just in case it does turn out to be significant. I'm also going to ask for a Bonferroni correction. Um, and if you're interested in doing contrasts between groups because you have a main effect, it's worth reading up about the Bonferroni correction and why it's very, very important that you apply that when performing these. I'll also ask for Cheeky's test, which is another method of um, comparing the groups in a more reliable way. What these two tests do is all possible pairwise comparisons. So it will compare um, clerical and custodial positions, custodial and manager, manager and clerical positions as well. So I'll now click continue. And then I will click on the options button. I'm going to ask for descriptive statistics so I can see if there are any differences, where, what exactly are the differences. Then I'll tick the estimates of effect size box because remember, just because it's significant does not mean it's important. And then I also have to tick the homogeneity tests so that it performs the test of homogeneity of variance. Um, it doesn't do that automatically like it does with the t-test, so you do have to tick that box. And that's one of the most important underlying assumptions of an analysis of variance. Now I'll click continue and OK. OK, so the first box tells us how many people are in each one of the groups that we're comparing. Um, ideally, you would have you know, roughly equal numbers in each of the groups that you're comparing in order to get a reliable um, analysis. However, um, it's not crucial unless you have a problem with homogeneity of variance as well. If your variances are quite different in the groups you're comparing and your sample sizes are quite different as well, that's a really big problem. So hopefully we don't have a problem with homogeneity of variance. In this next box, we just have the descriptive statistics, which gives us the mean standard deviation and the sample sizes within each one of the small groups that will be in our interaction comparison. And you'll notice here that people who are in a minority in management positions have a very, very small sample size here, which can be problematic. The next box is our Levine's test of equality of variances. So it's the same thing that we saw with a t-test, only it's comparing a lot more variances. So the Levine's statistic, based on the mean, because we are comparing means, is 2.749, and that is significant at less than 0 0.05. So this means that our homogeneity variance assumption has been violated. So all of the probability statistics that we have a look at um, further on in the ANOVA tables are not going to be reliable. So just be aware of that. I'll continue explaining the output 
um, but please bear that in mind. The test of between subjects effects is our ANOVA table. We have a row for the main effect of job category. So that's just job category on its own. So for two and 468 degrees of freedom, the F value for the main effect of job cat is 42.054. And that is significant at less than 0 0.001. So there's quite a decent difference between the three job categories. The main effect of minority for one and 468 degrees of freedom is, point, um, is 0 0.827 and the significance level is greater than 0 0.05. So there is no difference in education level in years between the two minority groups. The interaction between job category and minority is for two and 468 degrees of freedom, 0 0.910, and the significance level is less, oh sorry, greater than 0 0.05. So the interaction effect is also not significant. Next we have the partial eta squared. Um, estimate and this is our measure of effect size so basically it ranges from zero to one and none of these effects um, including the significant effect is not very large so it's only a very very small effect there's only a small difference between at least two of the groups that we're looking at if we scroll down a bit further, we can see the post hoc tests for employment category. Um, so we didn't do a, a post hoc test for minority classification because there are only two groups. It's clear that whichever one had the higher mean was significantly higher than the other if we had a main effect of minority classification. So we didn't need to do any further testing. But we did need to do further testing if we did have a significant main effect for job category. And we did. So these multiple, multiple comparisons would have had to have been conducted anyway. So the first half of the box gives us Chuhi's HSD. And believe it or not, HSD stands for Honestly Significant Difference. And I'm not joking. The bond for rate correction um, is given at the bottom of the table. So these do corrections for the multiple comparisons that we're conducting between more than two means with the same dependent variable. And as I suggested earlier on, you should check out the Bonferroni correction and the reason for doing it on the internet if you aren't already familiar with it. So the first row of this table compares clerical and custodial positions. The significance level is less than 0.001. So yes, there is a significant difference between these two groups. And in fact, you'll see that every single one of these significant values is less than 0.001. So that means all three job categories have significantly different mean education levels in years. They are all different from each other. So to find out where the differences are, you would then go and have a look at the descriptive statistics to see which means were, different, were higher than which. Um, you don't need to worry about the homogeneity um, or homogeneous subsets table. Um, and here are the profile plots. This explains why there was no interaction effect between minority classification and education level in years, um, because there's a similar pattern essentially. If any of these lines crossed over, then that would indicate there was an interaction effect. But here we can see they're all pretty much identical. And also the standard error bars overlap in each one of those instances. So the next type of analysis I'll show you is a repeated measures analysis of variance. Um, in the data set that we have open at the moment, there is no repeated measures experimental design that we can work with. So I need to open another data set and that's going to be the anxiety underscore two data set. 
that I showed you earlier. So I'll select Anxiety 2 and click Open. Okay, um, so here we have an experiment, a psychological experiment with 20 participants. The first column gives us their ID number. The next column is for their um, anxiety as measured on a 10 point scale, and that is before something nasty was done to them. The next column is their anxiety during something being nasty, um, something nasty being done to them. And the third column is for after the experiment to see what their level of anxiety is then. So we'd like to conduct a repeated measures analysis of variance to compare the means for these three groups. But we also want to take into account that there will be a correlation between these because some people are just naturally anxious and some people are naturally calmer. Okay, so we go into the Analyze menu, General Linear Model, and then select Repeated Measures. We have three factors, oh, oh, three levels of a within subjects factor in this particular experiment. Um, and I'm going to call the factor time because it's basically the time that they were tested before, during, or after. And we have three levels, so I'll type three into number of levels and then click add. I have no other variables that I want to include, so I just need to click define. So our first variable is going to be anxiety before, so I'll move that into the box. The second will be during, and the third will be after. It doesn't really matter which order you put these in, um, it will still give you the same results. Um, just a quick note, if you also want to include a between subjects factor, so you want to compare the difference between males and females, um, in these different experimental conditions, then you can put a between subjects factor here. And you can also do an analysis of covariance if you need to by putting a covariate in here. Okay, so um, we can't do post hoc tests. And I'll show you here, it's not allowing us to do post hoc tests. And that's because we don't have a between subjects factor. Post hoc tests here can only be conducted between between subjects variables, not within subjects or paired samples that we have here. If you want to do contrast when we, or if or when we do get a significant analysis of variance statistic, then you would actually have to do multiple pairwise comparisons using a t-test. Um, but please be careful when you're using a t-test to do those pairwise comparisons, you need to use something like the bond for any correction when doing so. Now I'll click on the options button. Um, again, I'm going to ask for descriptive stats and estimates of effect size. Um, I'm not going to ask for homogeneity tests because again, that only applies to between subjects designs. What we need here is a test of sphericity. So it's a similar assumption to homogeneity variance, but it's applicable only in within subjects or repeated measures designs. And an SBSS will give us that check automatically. We don't actually have to tick a box for it. So I'll just click continue. I could do plots again, um, but you've already seen how to do that. So I'll just click OK. And here we have our output. The first box tells us which variables were compared. It's one variable, but three different levels. The next box tells us the mean and standard deviation for these different groups. So it seems that their anxiety levels were on average lower before and then rose quite a lot during the experiment and didn't drop down that much after the experiment. The multivariate test box we don't need to worry about um, because the analysis of variance table is actually this one here, the test of within subjects effects. So just ignore that one for now. Morkley's test of sphericity is 
um, important to check the underlying assumption of sphericity. Um, essentially, we do not want Morkley's test of sphericity to be significant. So Morkley's W is 0 0.895 and the significance level is greater than 0 0.05. So our assumption of sphericity has been accepted, which indicates that any statistics we get and probability estimates are going to be reliable ones. Of course, you still need to check the underlying assumption of normality and so on. In terms of the within subjects effects, um, we're just looking at one main effect and that's for time and we can assume sphericity. So even if sphericity had been violated in the above test, then you can use one of these three optional values. At the moment, they're all producing exactly the same F statistic, and that's because there's no problem, no adjustment had to be made. But if an adjustment did have to be made, then you would use one of these estimates instead of the first row. So we can assume sphericity, and for two 38 degrees of freedom, we have an F value of 51.212. And the significance level is less than 0 0.001. So that means that there is a significant difference between at least two of the groups. So it doesn't mean that all three groups are different from each other. It could be that only before and during and before and after was significantly different, which I can tell you now that's exactly what the case is. Um, but that's what a significant result can tell you only, that there's at least a significant difference between two groups. The partial eta squared column gives us a measure of effect size. And again, this ranges from zero to one. So 0 0.729 is a very, very large effect. Okay, so we do have a very large effect size here. Um, it does say that it does within subjects contrast here. Um, however, you still need to perform pairwise comparisons using a paired samples t-test um, and not to rely on this because this will not tell you which groups are different from which. Okay, so the next type of analysis I'll show you is a factor analysis. Um, particularly, we'll be doing a principal components analysis, which is also known as an exploratory method. Um, for this, we need to open up a different data set. So I'll go into the file menu, open data, and we will be working with carsales.sav. So I click open. Uh, yes, if it asks you to set the width of all string variables to the minimum, always say yes. Okay, so here we have a data set where we are looking at car sales. We've got the different manufacturers, the different models of cars, and so on. Um, we have a lot of variables about um, descriptive things regarding the cars. So the price, engine size, horsepower, wheelbase, and so on. Um, there are a lot of variables here. And what the factor analysis allows us to do is to collapse these variables into meaningful factors so that we, in future um, analyses, only have to deal with a smaller number of variables, the factors, rather than the larger set of individual variables that we have here. So we can only do that if they are correlated with each other in some way, and they do hang together in a way that makes meaningful sense. So we need to conduct a factor analysis to see if that's the case and what those factors are going to be. So I'll go into the Analyze menu, Dimension Reduction, and choose Factor. I will put in the following variables. Uh, vehicle type, I'll just hold down the control key to select multiple ones. Price, engine size, horsepower, wheelbase, width, length, curb weight, fuel capacity, and fuel efficiency. And move that into the variables box. 
I'll now click the descriptives button. I'm going to ask specifically for the KMO and Bartlett's test of sphericity. And you might remember sphericity from the repeated measures analysis of variance. So it's a measure of whether or not they are correlated with each other. Um, and if they're not correlated with each other, they're not factorable. So this has to work out in order for us to say it's okay to create factors out of them because it makes sense to do that. They are correlated with each other. So I'll now click continue. I'll click on extraction. So this is where you choose the method of factor analysis you want to conduct. Principal components is the main exploratory factor analysis, the one that you use when you don't have any preconceptions about how specifically these variables will hang together. The next, next most common one is called principal axis factoring. But I'm just doing an exploratory factor analysis and we'll stick with principal components. I'm going to ask for a scree plot to be displayed because it's a graphical way of showing how many factors make meaningful sense with this data set. Then click continue. Next, I'll click rotation. Now, normally you would not rotate the factor analysis at this point. You would run the factor analysis to see if on its own it comes up with meaningful factors. I happen to know that this particular data set requires a Varimax rotation so that the factors make more sense than the unrotated solution. And I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, a Varimax rotation increases the or decreases the amount of correlation between the factors that result from the factor analysis. And there are other options here if you want to allow the factors to be more correlated with each other. But I've just chosen Varimax for this particular analysis. Okay, so by default, it's gonna display the rotated solution, which is what I want. That's after Varimax rotation. And then click continue. I'm also gonna click on the scores button. Um, when you are happy with your factor analysis and you're happy with the rotation that's applied and the a number of variables that are involved in the analysis, uh, when you're happy with all of those things, you want to save the factors as variables in your data set. So it will create new columns in this data set which reflect the score on each of the factors that it comes up with. So here we're actually going to come up with three different factors. It will give us three extra columns with a factor loading for each one of these cases on each one of those factors. I'm using the regression method. That's my personal preference, but there are other options here. Now I'll click continue and OK. OK, so the first box shows us our KMO and Bartlett's test of sphericity. These are two measures of factorability. So if your data isn't factorable, you can't really create factors from them. So we want um, Bartlett's test to be above 0.8, which it is, or actually 0.6 is fine as well, but it's above 0.8, so that's great. And we also want Bartlett's test of sphericity to be significant, which it is. So this is saying that there's enough correlation between our variables to make sense in creating factors. It is factorable. The communalities box tells us about how related each one of these variables is to each other. So it's kind of like a multiple regression analysis where here, um, vehicle type is the dependent variable and all the other variables are the independent variables and that's how much is being explained by all of these variables. So it's kind of like an R squared value. So we want these extraction numbers to be high. The lowest one is width, so it's not as related to all of the other variables, but it's still not a small amount, so it's probably 
worth keeping in. If you had um, an extraction value here that was say four, you might not include it in the factor analysis. In the total variance explained table, this tells us how many factors it found naturally. Um, so this is telling us that it found three factors because it stopped at three in giving us the percentage of variance the factors explained. Because it could continue up to 10 factors, but they're explaining such a small amount of variance that it's not worth creating those factors. So there are three main factors that occur in this data set. The first explains 59.938% of the variance, the second one 16.545, and the third one 11.227. So cumulatively, all three of them can explain 87.709% of the variance in the entire data set, which is very good. If we scroll down a bit further to the scree plot, this is another way to decide how many factors you want to create from this data set. And it's called a scree plot because scree is what you get when you have a rock fall. So when there's a rock fall, you have the rocks that fall down and then you have the rubble or the scree at the end. So here we have a big rock, big rock, big rock, and then we start getting rubble. So this is saying that there are three clear factors in this data set. Um, so it makes sense to do a three factor solution. Uh, just so you know, it is possible to force the factor analysis to only have two factors. You can also force the factor analysis to have four factors. Um, wouldn't recommend doing that, but it is possible if you need to. Okay, so now we have two component matrices. The first one is the unrotated solution. And the second one is after applying the Varimax rotation. So this is the reason why I actually conducted the Varimax rotation. If we have a look at the factor loadings, for a lot of these variables, it's not particularly clear which factor they load on the most. Okay, so there's no real clear differ differentiation. They're actually quite high loadings on two factors here. Um, decent loadings on these factors and these factors, it, it's difficult to determine the difference between them. Um, in order for the factor analysis to make sense, you want the variables that load the most on factor one to make theoretical or qualitative sense. A meaningful factor means that these have some meaningful way of being related. Um, here we have engine size, um, horsepower, wheelbase, width, length, curb weight, fuel capacity. There are so many variables on here and it's not clear what factor one would mean. When applying the Varimax rotation, the rotated component matrix, we can see the factor loadings tend to make more sense. Vehicle type then clearly loads on one factor and that is the third one. Price in thousands clearly loads on one. So it is engine size and horsepower. So price in thousands, engine size and horsepower relate to the prestige of the vehicle. So how much it costs and how much warmth it has. Factor two, wheelbase, width and length tend to load the most on those as well. Um, curb weight does load on it somewhat, um, but curb weight loads on all three quite a lot. So it's not clear which one curb weight really relates to. But in terms of factor two, if you think of curb base, um, um, wheel base, width and length, when you put those three together, it's all about the surface features of the car, so the way it was built. Factor three, We've got vehicle type loading on it, curb weight, fuel capacity, and fuel efficiency. So the type of vehicle it is, either a truck or a car, and 
the fuel capacity and efficiency all relate to the efficiency and economy of driving the car. So it makes sense to, to be able to label these factors as um, prestige as factor one, two as surface features, and three as economy. And if it makes sense like that, you know that you've got a good factor solution. Now, if I go back to the data set, you'll see that we have three new variables at the end. Um, and I have performed this factor analysis a few times, so please excuse me. Um, there are a couple of different ones here. Um, this one is an old one. And this one is an old one as well. So here are our factor scores. It gives you the score for each factor based on all of the variables in the factor analysis, not just the ones that loaded on this particular component, factor one, but every single one of the variables does have something to contribute to this factor. So we're not actually losing any information by creating a factor score using regression. And then all you have to do is go into the variable view, relabel these so that it makes sense. So I can label this one prestige, this second one, um, just call it surface features, and the third one, economy. Then you can use those for future analyses instead of all those other variables. Okay, uh, so that's factor analysis and that's all I wanted to show you today. Um, as always, if you need any help with SPSS with your own data after seeing these webinars, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email address is on the handout. Thank you for coming.